guys and welcome again to another bonus episode in Peace Walker. The, the first series to get three bonus episodes <laughs> because there's just like so much extra ground to cover in a, in a game like this where uh, there's all the briefing files and there's the post game and then there's the post post game where there's still stuff after you get that true ending. And this is like to just wrap everything up and provide, you know, in a sense, a setup to Ground Zeroes, so before I jump right into Ground Zeroes, we still need to just tie up a couple of uh, loose ends. So what we're going to do is listen to some more briefing files that are here. Uh, Miller has some more to say about some clients. Uh, Paz, nothing, because she is underwater. <laughs> uh, Chico has more to say about love, and we'll also listen to the Isla del Monstruo stuff. Um, then in Data Files, um, I've been uh, I've been given some comments stating you know there's still more like afterwards of what you can get and um, you know if you want to know here's how you can get those things so I have uh, three of Strange Love's memories uh, which you get in like the first type AI battles and then you can also unlock Puzzle's diary um, by doing the type two battles and there's ten entries but Puzzle's diary because it's a bit of a slog to get through, uh, I believe, uh, because, you know, I'm already setting up and getting ready for Ground Zeroes, is I am aware that Paz's diary is actually right at the beginning of Ground Zeroes, just in the files, so you can listen to it because of how hard it was to get into. <clears throat> in Peace Walker. So I'm not going to listen to it in Peace Walker, but we will listen to it in Ground Zeroes. So we're just doing like an all-encompassing uh, setup episode for Ground Zeroes at the moment. So this will include some briefing files and all of this leftover stuff from Peace Walker. Uh, Strange Love's Memories and those leftover files. It'll include Paz's Diary uh, from the Ground Zeroes uh, menu and it'll include house uh, the snake and miller sauna like uh, thing that they dubbed over like they they voiced it robin atkin downs and david hader and then we will also listen to um the full uh audio drama which is like the tapes of how snake met miller uh we will listen to that as well so that is available in the it's like a Japanese, but ink translated to English subtitles, um, in Ground Zeroes as well, but I believe it's in the Japanese version. So that is what we will be covering in this episode. This is sort of like that bridging gap from Peace Walker to Ground Zeroes. So we'll include both games in this one episode to just get that information. So we're all, I have everything, uh, that I need, uh, before we jump in. Oh, and I think one extra thing. One more secret thing is um, I have also been told by clearing every single extra op, including the monster hunts, uh, you get one more, you get one more briefing file and um, I am going to watch the briefing file. Uh, I will look up the video and we will react and watch that briefing file together as well uh, because... Um, those custom battles <laughs> I don't I just actually to, to be able to do like a let's play and actually continue the series without taking a huge break that's like for me to grind it um, this is just the best option for you and me uh, for us to just sit and we'll just pull up the video and, and watch it because it is just a briefing file I'm not going to go through all of that pain suffering and grinding uh, to get to it myself <laughs> Uh, maybe one day in my own time, but that's that's later down the line. But that's essentially the purpose of this episode, guys. So let's jump in and cover all those bases today. Um, I'm doing this uh, for for all of us, so I am on the same page uh, as you guys going into Ground Zeroes, and we have all of the information because I think this is probably a good thing to to um, include instead of just being like, ah, oh, it's fine, it's just briefing files. But I think that they will be they will be important. So let's jump into it now, guys. Okay, Strange Love Memories, a chance meeting. I'm about to leave for Costa Rica place completely unfamiliar to me, and on a top-secret mission for the CIA, no less. No guarantees I'll come back alive. Might even get rubbed out by the CIA itself. So I'm leaving behind this record. 
for her sake. For the boss's honor. Ever since I was a child, I've loved to look up at the night sky. I'd go outside after sunset and drink in the cold air. The moon, Venus, so many stars floating on the edge of infinity. In Manchester, it wasn't very often you saw the night sky in all its star-studded glory, but it was enough to stir a deep longing inside me. Even as others cowered beneath Nazi air raids, I was out there, watching the skies, dreaming of one day reaching the heavens. There were, of course, more practical concerns. My skin was incredibly sensitive. Even the slightest bit of sun would turn it an angry shade of red. Playing outside during the day was completely out of the question. Naturally, I hardly ever had the chance to play with other children my age. But I never felt lonely for it. Their way of thinking was irrational, making them simple, easy to predict. The boys would talk of tanks and aeroplanes and creepy, crawly bugs. The girls of pretty dresses, glass beads, and tea and cakes. Of boys they liked. I never had much to say on such matters. The curious thing is, adults really aren't all that different. They're simple, capricious, especially men. As they get older, their heads fill with thoughts of women and more women. Thankfully, I always did have a head for mathematics. When I was about 10, I visited Dr. Turing, who <laughs> lived nearby. We'd mm -hmm. sit and discuss mathematical logic. The lights were always on at his house, even in the dead of night. Theoretically, he'd say, there's no algorithm that a computing machine couldn't reproduce. Dr. Turing wasn't foolish like other men. Although I didn't find out why until later, after he died. The time will come, he'd say, when computers will be able to think for themselves. That idea rocked me to my core. My attitude for mathematics brought me closer to the stars. I breezed through school, then went to America for university. While I was studying at Caltech, NASA was established. I signed up in a heartbeat. I was a pretty good computer engineer at the time, and NASA needed skills like mine. The work was enjoyable. Even though I'd given up on going into space myself, it was a pleasure just being a part of it all. I was assigned to Project Mercury, America's effort to compete with the Soviets in manned spaceflight. Seven men were chosen as pilot candidates for the program becoming heroes overnight. People called them the Mercury Seven. The project made good progress, more or less. We had all the funds and materials we needed. After countless hours of analysis, we even had plans for something on par with Sputnik. We thought it'd only be a matter of time before we caught up with the Russians. They'd sent a dog into orbit and brought it back safely to Earth. But NASA top brass dismissed that success as a fluke. <laughs> the Americans recovered their re-entry capsules at sea. But the only ocean bordering the Soviet Union is the Arctic. So their re-entry capsules had to make impact on land. A dog was one thing, but human spaceflight would still take some time. Or so we thought. At the end of January 1961, we successfully put a chimpanzee named Ham into orbit. He returned to Earth as healthy as ever. NASA was giddy with success. It was then that a new woman showed up for duty. Hmm. She was a backup pilot and advisor. The boss. She was beautiful. Hmm. With blonde hair, strong mouth, and a steely gaze. But there was something else in those eyes. A twinkle of something warmer. Of affection. It was the boss. Mm. She took one look at us in our revelry and murmured, Savor this joy today, because tomorrow you'll have to face the truth. And she was right. The next day, our project schedule was accelerated. We'd received new information that the Soviets were mere months away from putting a man into space. 
the brass had misjudged the Russians. We couldn't afford to allow the shock of another Sputnik. Somehow, we had to get a man into space before the Russians did. It was an utterly impossible task. We'd only just put our first chimp up. With a human on board, failure was not an option. Especially if it were one of the Mercury 7 Golden Boys. And on top of that, the brass wanted to put a window in the spacecraft. The pilot wouldn't be a test animal this time, they said. And when this hero came back alive and well, they wanted him to describe what he'd seen. It was madness. Adding a window to our existing spacecraft would leave it unable to handle the stress. Not to mention the problem of shielding the occupant from cosmic rays. But the boss rose to the task, and splendidly. She claimed to be a layman when it came to space, but caught on keenly to new ideas and concepts. She was demanding of herself and of others. She seemed rather cold-hearted at times, but I was smitten. She was beautiful, yes, but more than that, she was wise. Her mind was thoroughly rational, and yet no matter how I tried, I could never predict her actions. It was easy for me to assume that her judgments were drawn from an enormous base of knowledge. Quite simply, her life experiences were more diverse, more intense than anyone else's. To me, they seemed boundless in their breadth. In her, I saw a reflection of the night sky. Perhaps because I too was a woman, she and I became close. I couldn't go out in the sun, but she lit up my life. Her light was soft, like that of the moon. I was so happy. With her unerring guidance, the project steadily regained its footing. But one issue remained, the pilot's safety. When the day came to choose a pilot, the Mercury 7 just quietly walked out. Who could blame them? It was far too great a risk to take. Even if they'd volunteered, NASA would never have let them go. They were national heroes, basking in the media spotlight. There was no way they'd be sent on such a mission. The conference room was silent. Then, slowly, she raised her hand, almost as if acting out a scene from a movie. There you go. It's, it's interesting because... Um... That's essentially Strange Love's perspective on the Eva tape that we listened to because we knew that it was going to be the boss um, and seeing how Strange Love perceived uh, all of that because the boss has told Eva this and then Eva's telling us this in the, in the delivery. But this was just Strange Love doing a tape um, for herself, which is like um, in her name. So there's also Joy and then Separation. So we can only guess. Uh, what those are for, so let's get into Joy now. I spoke out against her going, submitting a report stating the ray shielding was inadequate. But the brass's response was brusque. She's already been exposed to a nuclear test in Nevada. She's the perfect candidate. It was completely irrational. Repeated exposure to radiation would only increase the danger. But the government was still reeling from the Soviet success with Sputnik. There was no hope of getting a rational response. They were simply too panicked. People can be so obtuse when it comes to things they can't see. I, however, understood all too well. Just as invisible ultraviolet radiation scorched my skin, heavy particle radiation from space would cause irreparable harm to human tissue. In a word, she was expendable. It was during the boss's pre-flight checkup that I noticed something strange on the x-ray of her skull. Part of the right hemisphere of her brain was damaged. It seemed inexplicable, given her keen intelligence and amazing physical prowess, but there it was, and I decided to report it. I hoped that perhaps my discovery of a physical defect would result in the flight being cancelled. But as I went to make my report, she stopped me. Why, I demanded. How can you let yourself be their guinea pig? Ignoring my protests, she took me up to the roof of the lab. The night sky was ablaze with stars. 
It was there that I learned how she had wounded her head. 1943, Los Alamos. She was serving with the special forces when she received new orders. A German spy had infiltrated the Manhattan Project, which aimed to build the world's first atomic bomb. She was to eliminate him. His name was John von Neumann, a mathematician with superhuman computational abilities and the designer of the explosive lens. The Manhattan Project was a top national priority, security accordingly tight. The guards couldn't be allowed to know what was going on. She'd have to slip past them and make the death look like an accident. It should have been an easy enough mission. But just before the operation, she received unexpected news. A new life was growing inside her. Hmm. She was overcome with joy. And for one brief moment, it clouded her judgment. She accidentally got into a shootout with the guards and without thinking, protected her belly. She was shot in the head. The bullet only grazed the surface of her brain, but the tissue around the wound was destroyed, leaving her in a coma. She wasn't given much chance of recovery, but three months later, she woke up. Within six, she was able to move around as if nothing had happened. It was functional compensation. The other parts of her brain took over for the part that was lost. It made logical sense, but such a full recovery was nothing short of a miracle. Perhaps her superhuman willpower made it possible. Or perhaps, perhaps my body knew it had to survive for the sake of my unborn child. She smiled as she said that. I understand how she must have felt. Some have taken to calling me Ms. Left Lobe, she said. <laughs> because I'll do anything for the mission. She was tough, yes. But she had feelings too. I knew that better than anyone else. As it turned out, von Neumann wasn't the spy. The assassination order was a deliberate bit of misinformation planted by the Russians. She had been deceived. The Eastern and Western camps were united on one point, opposition to the Nazis. The Allies needed to develop that bomb before Hitler did. But in looking ahead, the Russians found the Manhattan Project's progress a little too quick for their liking. Mass production of a uranium bomb, like the one that was eventually dropped on Hiroshima, would be difficult from a material perspective. But a plutonium bomb, once perfected, could be mass-produced, and eventually even miniaturized. And Moscow did not like the idea of America having that kind of head start. Explosive lens technology was critical to the plutonium design, so the plan was to get rid of its pioneer, von Neumann. And when that plot came to light, the US and the Soviet Union parted ways for good. It was one of the rare cold nights in Florida. She put her arm gently around my shivering shoulders. As I listened to her voice, I was wrapped in her soothing scent. I felt as if I were dreaming. Even in failure, she seemed perfect. Oddly enough, the failed assassination attempt helped preserve America's edge. A true super genius. Von Neumann went on to make his mark in the forest fields outside of the Manhattan Project. Block my sneeze. Economic game theory, stored program computing. Almost all computers today use stored programs. The so-called Von Neumann architecture. His death would have set back computing 10 years, and I wouldn't be at NASA doing research. I wouldn't have been there in her arms that night. I thanked the fates for giving me that chance. But then she said something unexpected. I should have killed von Neumann when I had the chance. Mm. Why, I asked. Wasn't the order a Soviet plot? I looked up at her as she began to explain. Yes, von Neumann was innocent, and killing the innocent is a grave crime. But I can't help but wonder, had I succeeded, what would the world be like now? Even without von Neumann, the explosive lens would have eventually been developed. Von Neumann architecture, too. 
But she seemed to believe that if progress had been put off for a few years, then perhaps East and West would have had a chance to work hand in hand. I'd never considered such a possibility, but her tone was confident, assertive. It was as if she intended to make the two superpowers shake hands herself. The explosive lens was developed too early, spawning a cold war and an endless nuclear arms race, she continued. That mission sprung from deceit, but maybe it was divine providence too. It was like she was speaking to her own child. Her large, warm hand was on my head. I failed the mission because I let the mother in me take over. I should have killed him, no matter how great the guilt. If I'd killed him, I might not have prevented Hiroshima, but maybe I could have saved everyone in Nagasaki. I looked up at her and saw her looking up too, up at the starry sky. Her face showed only deep remorse. It was as if she'd convinced herself that she alone was responsible for creating this twisted world. But that's no reason for you to sacrifice yourself for this. I knew I'd never dissuade her, and yet I still clung to hope. I know you're concerned and I thank you, but I have to be loyal to the end. And then she smiled at me. Loyal to the end. Loyal to what? I asked. But she didn't answer. These tapes are good. This this is some, this is some good uh, good backstory stuff. And like whenever she's like, "Man, I should have killed him when I had the chance." It's just like I always think about that like a lot. Is like fork in the road moments that it's like there's literally just one thing you can do, and sometimes it's the tiniest thing ever, and it can just change absolutely everything. I think about fork in the road moments a lot. But we'll get into the next tape now, which is separation. The days that followed were spent training tirelessly for our first space flight. The boss endured conditioning that tested the limits of human capability, and I supported her. Those were happy days. On April 12th, the spacecraft carrying the boss left the Earth's atmosphere. Although it was only 20 minutes of ballistic flight, it was nothing short of miraculous, considering how little time we'd had. The first human in space. We were ecstatic. Then something went wrong. The re-entry angle was slightly off, warping the outer hull. The cause was clear. It was the hastily constructed window we'd installed. Her capsule missed the projected splashdown point by a long shot. As we raced towards the capsule, a breaking news broadcast came over the radio. It was the news report of the successful launch of the Vostok rocket, piloted by the cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin. They'd beaten us into space by the slimmest of margins. When we arrived, the capsule had already disappeared beneath the waves. The boss was floating on the surface. I... I can't really recall what happened next. They told me later that I gave a strange scream and plunged <laughs> into the sea, not caring whether my skin would burn. She didn't wake up. Good job, strange love. Her entire body was bruised, burnt, scorched by cosmic rays. It was a miracle she was still alive. Every day, propaganda boasting of the shining accomplishment flowed out of the Soviet Union. The hardest part was having to read the report the next morning from Izvestia, the Soviet governmental paper, written there after the report, were those legendary words of Major Gagarin. The Earth is blue. Earth is blue. The person who should have said those words, though, was incapacitated, confined to a bed. NASA opted to pretend the flight had never happened. The Soviets had orbited a man around the Earth and returned him safely. We'd barely managed to escape the atmosphere and achieve ballistic flight. Even worse, the pilot was horribly mangled and the spacecraft lost altogether. As they saw it, covering it up was the only alternative to seeing the nation's pride dealt yet another blow. I've been told military records show the boss was taking part in the Bay of Pigs incident at the time. 
they were that desperate to erase the whole affair. In the end, Alan Shepard's ballistic flight one month later became known as America's first space flight. Shepard's flight owed its success to insights earned through the boss's sacrifice. But to me, none of that mattered. I prayed day and night for her recovery, never leaving her sight, not even for a moment. Then, as summer ended and the chill of winter approached, she spoke. Give me water. <clears throat> I threw myself on her breast and she embraced me. It was all I needed. I thought she would tell me about space, the true sky where the stars don't twinkle. But the only thing she'd speak of was Earth, our home as she'd seen it from space, so fleeting, so irreplaceable. I was ashamed. I'd been enamored for so long with the sky that I never thought to look beneath my feet at the ground upon which I stood. As soon as her rehab was over, she was gone. It happened without warning. No one informed me, and the higher-ups wouldn't say a word. It wasn't so strange or surprising, really. I simply assumed she was off to complete her next mission, because she was loyal to the end. Since then, I've devoted myself to researching artificial intelligence, so that no one will ever have to make her sacrifice again. No human being should be asked to take on a mission that dangerous. Next time, I'll be the light that shines on someone else. I still wonder why she opened up to me on that chilly night in Florida. That operation was top secret, even if it was all in the past. I like to think it was because she trusted me. But that's probably not the case. She wanted someone to listen. And I don't think that someone was me. Those faraway eyes, the tone of her voice, like she was talking to her own child. Those things made it clear that she was speaking to someone else. I found myself envying that someone. Four years later, I learned of her death. A traitor's death, no less. She'd stolen an American nuke and defected to the Soviet Union, where she was killed by her former apprentice. Or so I was told. I refused to believe it. She'd never do such a thing. I could think of only two possibilities. Either she really was trying to bring East and West together, or she truly did want to be killed. She believed the world is not the way it's supposed to be, that it's been unbalanced by the tenuous peace offered of nuclear deterrence, and that she was to blame. Perhaps her death was an act of atonement. She was loyal to the end, to our world. And I lost the light of my life. I now find myself victim to an incredibly <laughs> irrational emotion of my own. That someone, the one she wanted to confess her sin to, <sighs> could it be the one who took her life? The very thought drives me utterly mad with jealousy. One day, I will discover the truth. Strange Love's Thoughts. Read all of Strange Love's memoirs. Cool. All right. We got Strange Love's uh, stuff done. Um, so we're now going to listen to um, what Chico and Miller have to say. Uh, we will then move into uh, some other things. I think we'll leave the secret briefing file that we unlock after everything. It seems to be like kind of beneficial for us to like listen to that right at the end. Um, so I'll save that for the end. So we'll jump in between games, I think. Uh, but yeah, we'll listen to Chico now. Tigrex is a flying dragon just like Rathalos. 
But it's good at moving around on land too. It can blast you with rocks from a distance or rush at you with incredible speed. Yeah, I know. I've seen it on land. See, it said that these two lady pirates, Anne and Mary, visited Isla del Monstruo. It was there that they did battle with Tigrex. Anne was quite a marksman, wasn't she? Must have been a heck of a battle. I wish I'd been there. You know, I'm not so bad with guns myself. I've already seen how good you are. Okay, that's Tigrex. Tigrex was a hell of a fight. Velocipres, I assume, are the like the blue ones that are running around in the fights. Anne and Mary also saw little dinosaurs running around the island. Velocipres? Yup. As you would expect, they're very nimble, but no match for a firearm. You wouldn't want to get surrounded by them, though. I'll bet. Nobody wants to be outnumbered in battle. Right. Your best move would be to make sure they cannot encircle you. Well, stealth is the basis of all solo sneaking missions. While it makes battle tougher, working alone has its advantages when it comes to infiltration. That's what makes you the boss, boss. You don't need any advice from me. Not bad for an old timer, eh, Chico? <laughs> nope. Still, be careful. Alright. Love. Now, we had puppy love. And he's like, ah, how do I talk to Paz? We're like, be yourself, Chico. Paz's true self, however, I wonder how we're going to get some insight into Chico's reaction, how he feels about Paz's reveal being affiliated with Cypher. Chico, I heard you saw Paz trying to sabotage Zeke before she activated. I, I should have stopped her. If only I hadn't run away. I could have captured her before she got inside. If I'd done that, she'd still be here. She was carrying a gun. Probably trained to use it too. Don't blame yourself. You couldn't have stopped her anyway. You were unarmed. I could have at least talked to her. If I'd promised not to tell anyone, Paz wouldn't have gone and done what she did. It's just... It's just I was so shocked. I, I, I panicked. I ran away. Chico, when you saw Paz, she was trying to sabotage it, right? Huh? Well, yeah. And right after that, she took control of it, tried to make me surrender. Something doesn't add up. Why would she sabotage Zeke when she was about to use it against me? What? Her actions were inconsistent. Even for a spy, if she wanted to destroy Zeke, she could have done it and run away. But if her goal was to steal Zeke, she'd have no motive to sabotage it. I, I don't know. Maybe your seeing her caused her to change her plan. <sighs> I don't get it. Interesting. Okay. So he feels guilty, like he could have he could have stopped her from from doing it. Uh, Miller has some details on clients: uh, Puzz, Snuff, Tobacco, and Cipher. Remember that habit Puzz had, Snake? How she always had her index finger on her upper lip, like this? Yeah. Yeah, it bugged me ever since we first met her. Never figured her for a snuff user. Yeah, right. I believe we never noticed. She used the kind where you keep a pouch of leaf in your upper jaw, let it absorb through your gums. She might not have been used to it. Probably used her finger to keep it in place. That's an that's an interesting detail, actually. How could pause? We were gonna start a band together. She was posing as a KGB agent too. Triple agent. On the act to get close to Galvez. Wonder how much Coleman knew. But the whole time she was working for some organization called Cipher. Huh? Cipher. Ring any bells, cuz? Cipher. Cipher. It means code or zero in Arabic numerals. Zero. Does that mean something to you? Not sure. Hmm. You know, Cipher and zero were basically the same word. It's a linguistic redundancy. The word stems from the Sanskrit shunya. It corresponds to the Buddhist concept of emptiness. In Buddhism, shunya means hollow. It supposedly refers to something that's swollen and empty on the inside. A big swollen emptiness. Just like outer space. I guess this briefing file must have been set before Miller goes, Hey, <laughs> I actually knew about it. And then he re-explains the cipher meaning zero for the cutscene. 
Cute. All right. Well, that's, um, like I said, Puzzle's Diary will do in ground zeros. Uh, so we will uh, listen to that there. So that's that stuff. Um, I will then jump into, let's do this Peace Walker sauna thing with with uh, cars and snake. Um, and then we'll do the ground zero story of how they met. Um, and then we, uh, at the same time, because ground zeros, we will also do... Uh, Paz's diary, the 10 entries, um, and then uh, the secret briefing file at the end, and I think that covers everything. Alright, so we're about to get into the Metal Gear Solid Peace Walker sauna track, uh, which is an English dubbed thing between Robin Atkin Downs and David Hayter. This is on Robin Atkin Downs' uh, actual YouTube channel, uh, so let's give that a listen right now. you take your sunglasses off? Oh, that's why it's so dark, huh? Uh, <laughs> Boss? Is that you, Snake? It's finished, huh? What? The new room. Oh, the uh, sauna? It's not your style. Huh? I'm, I'm gonna see if I can fix... I, I think it's only auto-generated only auto generated subtitles we're probably going to have to go without the probably have to going to go without the subtitles otherwise it's going to be a bit weird and i'm not sure how quiet it is so i'll just turn up the i'll turn up the audio for the volume here and let's let's hang on let's start again <laughs> boss is that you snake it's finished huh what the new room Oh, the, uh, sauna? It's not your style. Huh? I mean, isn't this a bit much? A sauna in Mother Base? Uh, boss, you were the one who approved it. Yeah, I changed my mind during a mission. It's too expensive. <laughs> We've been through this before. We're using water from the ocean and saving energy. It's economic. And I thought since we have some Finnish soldiers on our side, that this might boost their morale. Hmm. Hey, you want some soap? Catch. D no! Ugh. The sauna is popular with the staff, you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you wait until it gets hot, and then you just pour out some water to create the steam. It's just like a finished sauna, and you can fit 20 people in here. So, Snake. Yeah, I heard people have been injured in here. Oh? Uh, that was just a bruise. Just a bruise? I heard they won't recover for a month. Who was it anyway? I didn't get the full story. Armadillo. Were you here when it happened? Oh, yeah. I mean, he just uh, uh, fell. You know, probably slipped on a bar of soap. Slipped? Armadillo? Guy's built like a tank. He's got perfect posture. I've never seen him fall. Uh, yeah, well, he did fall. He fell, and all the birds that were resting on top of Mother Base went flying. Uh, Maybe he just... <laughs> so the sauna made him fall, huh? Boss? Cuz... Boss? Is there anything you want to tell me? About that snake. Are you going inside the sauna? Sure. Lead the way. Show me how it's done. Look at the steam. That injury on your thigh. Huh? What are you looking at? Your whole body. Except the part you're covering with that towel. Cuz... So th this sauna is uh, pretty refreshing. It beats all that dry tropical weather outside. Yeah, so... Cuz... What are those leaves for? Uh, they're called Vita. Leaves from a uh, Japanese white birch. Vita? Y you strike yourself with it. Like this. <laughs> Stimulates blood circulation and gives you energy. Let me see it. Here. 
<laughs> this is good. <laughs> it, it was a bit too strong, boss. Kaz, show me your back. My back? Yeah, get up and turn around. Why, Snake? Just take off the towel. Uh, Snake? Where are you touching me? Mm. It's not just your thigh that's injured. The injuries go all the way up to your ass. <laughs> Looks like something clawed at it. Th th that's enough. No, show me more. Turn around. What? Turn around. S snake. Gaz. Are you popular? Snake, where are you touching? <laughs> Do you remember? In the early days of MSF, you asked me how many women I'd had. Or were you really asking how many of them you could make yours? <laughs> it's been two years, so... How many new girls have you had? This many. Uh, approximately. That many? Ugh... You have such a busy life, yet you still find the time to keep yourself popular with the ladies. <laughs> Look, I'm not going to control everyone's love affairs. That's your responsibility. You're a free man. I would expect nothing less, boss. Yeah, however, I also believe it's important to not set a bad example for the rest of the staff. You understand that, right? You're getting a bit red, boss. Maybe I should... Kaz, you're the sub-commander here. You should have a little more common sense. What? Gazelle came to see me after a mission. She wanted to talk. She's good-looking, isn't she? Yeah. Did you... do it? Did she say we did it? She said she saw you with Swan. Seems like a shame someone's so good-looking working in a place like this. They both... You came in here with Swan for a shower, didn't you? Just the two of you. Alone. Alone. <laughs> that hurt! So what's it going to be? Soap play, huh? Are you still blaming the soap? The steam? It was just a... Talk. I, I, I'm sorry. It, it wasn't planned. Wasn't planned? Armadillo <laughs> saw you both, didn't he? Saw you with his girlfriend. <laughs> and I'd say he was pretty surprised to find you both in here. Armadillo. So proud. Built like a tank. But then, he just lost his balance, right? Just happened to fall and the birds went flying, huh? Vita. Two-timer. What the hell were you thinking? Whatever happened to chivalry? Snake! To think I even have to give you this sermon. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm a bad person, I get it. Yeah, but it wasn't just them, was it? Dolphin, Puma. Do you want me to beat you for all of them, too? I didn't do anything. Oh. You son of a bitch. <laughs> beat you down. <laughs> Don't you move a muscle. Boss, calm down. Dolphin, Puma, Gazelle, they are treating them like animals and forgetting that they're people. Wait! Snake kick! Snake kick! Seriously, cause it's either women no, or no. us. <laughs> Bruce before hose, dude. Remember, bastard. you bastard. What's wrong with that? <laughs> nice punch, but it'll take more than that to take me down. Impressive as always, boss. <laughs> What are you carrying there, Kaz? A Fulton recovery system. <laughs> what do you intend to do with it? How about a little flying, boss? 
listen, apologize to everyone, and try to be a little more careful. <clears throat> oh, okay. And you're gonna clean the sauna for the next year. Y yes, boss. <laughs> Good. What are you all looking at? What are you all looking at? <laughs> Just two naked men beating each other in the outdoors on the MSF plant. You know, there's no no problem with that. Snake teaches Miller a lesson in how to respect women by beating his ass. <laughs> oh my god. I wonder if this is just the end. That's so- that is so funny! <laughs> wild. Um, wild. Cool. It just played the it just played an outro song. So there you go. Um, so this is from uh, this is from 2018. Uh, broadcast on 2018. So Peace Walker came out in 2010. So this is like eight years after. So I can understand how like their voices would be not exactly the same. And we, as we know with uh, with uh, David Hayter, is his snake slash big boss. Excuse me. His uh, snake slash uh, big boss voice changes from 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 game to game, and then like you know he jumps into the future and he's voicing a character in the past, and it's very interesting. So it makes me wonder. Uh, it makes me wonder what his voice will sound like in Metal Gear Solid Five, because it's just like, will I assume Robin Atkin Downs would still stay as Miller as well? So you know. Because they're, they're still doing they're still doing their roles. Because we've had we've had characters change voices over time, like Ocelot. But I guess that's like future and past uh, Ocelot. I'm hoping that we see. I'm hoping that we get Ocelot back in Metal Gear Solid Five. Um, bringing that up, by the way, is because he's been severely missed. I have missed seeing him. Um, the fact that there's just no Ocelot around Peace Walker at all. Um, is, is very interesting, unless there's like something super secret that I haven't come across. Um, not even an Ocelot phone call at the end of the credits, but um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see whether he'll be doing an even like older, gruffer voice for, for Big Boss in Metal Gear Solid 5. Because this was, this was um, the voice that he did here in 2018 was like much higher, like uh, much lighter in tone, I felt. Like um, it wasn't as like gruff. Um, as he was doing in uh, Metal Gear Solid 4 and Peace Walker, which is uh, which is very interesting. But this was uh, this was incredible. So <laughs> I love that. So that was the that was the sauna the sauna track. Um, we'll be moving into uh, Snake and Kaz's first encounter, um, which is in the Japanese version of Metal Gear Solid 5 uh, Ground Zero. So we'll be uh, subtitles for this one. Um, and then uh, Paz's diary, uh, and then the, the briefing call. So I think it's these, it's these here. So this is Snake and Kaz's uh, first encounter, finally translated. So it was a Peace Walker related thing, but it got translated in Ground Zeroes. Uh, so Peace and Kazuhira Blues, first encounter, uh, five chapters um, and it's also something an improvement that's really cool that I love to see here is uh, You can see that the cassette tapes that you're about to get into have a timer You know how long they're gonna be when you get into them, which is uh, which is awesome. So um, We're gonna jump into this one. This one's a long one. So uh, these five chapters will total uh, in the timer bar here 36 minutes uh, and 20 seconds um, so I'm going to take a quick break um, and then we're going to sit down and we're going to work our way through um, the first encounter, which I believe, uh, you know, we've had, we've listened to How Snake Met Miller in one briefing file, but this looks like to be like a full expansion uh, of that one. And this will be my first time listening to Snake and Miller's uh, Japanese voice actors as well. So uh, we'll get into that now. 
Alright, Snake and Kaz's first encounter. Finally translated. いきなり何の話だ。戦場で敵同士として出会った俺とあんたが今はこうして共に戦ってるってことがさ。コロンビアでのことがああ。自衛隊を飛び出してコロンビアに流れ着いた俺は実戦経験もないくせにいきなり革
俺たち日本人は二度と負けないたとえどんな手段を使おうと決して負けない負けな<笑>This music's actually great. And that'll move into into chapter two. What I what I think is what I think's awesome. What I think's awesome is um how good the 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 voices are. I love Japanese voices, but the voice actor for, for Big Boss sounds sounds really cool. Really, really cool. Um it's like damn, do I just go and like play the <laughs> the would watch the Japanese versions with subtitles now because I'm gonna fall in love with these voices. Alright, let's get into let's get into chapter two. セーフが立てた臨時収容施設だ。思ったより顔色がいいな。え、あ、そうな、へい。アバウトだ。お前も主流だもんなしだ。帰れ。あの、急に痛みを忘れさせてやってもいいんだぞ。こっちも仲間を
正規軍のやつらが言う処刑ここじゃ見慣れた風景だ<笑>どうだ俺のところに来るんなら全部チャラ無罪方面にしてやる雇われ兵のあんたに何ができるここの基地司令官と俺は仲良しでね仲良しやつの上層部に知られたくない秘密が俺の日記帳に書いてあるくらいのがブラックメールかやつにとっちゃ命だ<笑>おい良質だぞクラシックシガービッグボス<笑>だがなぜ俺をここを抜け出したら軍隊復帰するかもしれないんだぜいや噂を聞いて噂カズヒラ・ミラーは反政府組織を壊滅させるために潜入した政府側の工作員だったというなでたらめだ政府軍のディスインフォメーション工作 CIA の入れ知恵かくだらんなだが反政府組織はどう思う部隊は全滅お前の死体は残っていないお前を疑うよなあんたかあんたがその噂をいやだがどっちにしろお前はもう戻れない反政府軍は裏切り者カズヒラ・ミラーへ報復に出るだろう単独のフリーランサーとしてはやりづらくなるな少なくともこの辺じゃかといって出国も命がけだろう反政府勢力に加担するのは割が合わん金も装備もないが責任は重いからなだが政府軍もやめておけ権力の不臭が体に染みつく俺どこに来い装備は自前で揃ってるイデオロギーもパワーバランスも関係ない戦いを求める者の理想郷だ俺があんたにつくだっていくら雇われでも敵方のあんたに戦うことしかできない人間がいる生まれつきか誰かにそうさせられたか戦いにしか生の充足を得られないやつがあ<笑>だが何のために戦う国家族金か俺はどうでもいいだがそういう連中が同じ境遇を持ったやつら同士が仲間になった方がいい殺し合うくらいならな勝利かさもなくばしか<笑>俺はあんたへの負けを認めてないそうかあんたにつく理由がないおそうだ勝負をしないか勝負あんたが勝ったら仲間になってやるよだが負けたら俺を逃がしてくれ何をする気だあんたと決着をつけたいだけだよ。どうだ傷を治して一週間後だ。勝負の内容と場所は俺が決める。<笑>いいだろう。おい俺が勝って自由になったら噂を流す。あんたは工作員で、反政府勢力に情報を流してるってな。<笑>何がおかしい尋問はあんたが受けるんだこいつもあんたが使え<笑>分かった何か必要なものがあったらここの連中に言え俺から伝えておくそうするよあそうだん脱走は考えるなここの兵隊は従順だが気性が荒い下手順を置いたら勝負は永遠にお預けになるぞああじゃあまたな和平ミラーカズヒラミラーおいん俺は金のために戦ってるんじゃないじゃあなんだいやあんたに話すようなことじゃないなんて呼べばいい俺かああボスと呼べ<笑>俺はスネークだスネーク一週間後ああこれここは置いとくぞ
Why why is this not like an anime mini series? Like where's my where's my Metal Gear Solid anime? It's so good. Um cool. We're about to get into chapter three, so let's get into that now. あんたが言ってくれたおかげだろう。キャンプの兵士たちは協力的だったよ。監視役の兵士はついたが、病院の敷地内なら自由に動けた。監視役はこう言った。ボスにそうしろと頼まれたからな。目がまっすぐだった。
しかも一人や二人じゃないおい侍僕はやめた方がいいマスター・トラッカービッグボスもしはここじゃなきゃまずいなぜだおお待て何をおじけづいてるんだスネークあんたの兵士に見張りをさせておけばいいそいつらが近づいてこないようにそれに俺が逃げられないようになもちろんそのつもりだこの人数と装備を見たら誰も近づいてこないそうだろう分かったで何をする気だ森で魚をつくスピアフィッシングだやったことはナイフでならナイフでこんな便利なものは持ってないからな<笑>そうかまあいい取った魚の数と大きさで競う平和的だろほら、うん、これで俺が勝ったら納得するんだなもちろんだあんたをボスって呼んでやるよ<笑>よし長いは無用だ始めよう<笑>うん、I wish I could see this story happen, you know? This would be so good to see. Snake and, Manil、uh, Snake and Miller relationship is actually so good. これじゃモズの餌だ。本当。ジュジュだけ。七<笑>匹。しかも全部一メートル近い。へー。よし、お前にハンデをやる。ハンデ。この先、たった一度でもお前が勝てば、その時点でミッション完了だ。お前を逃がして、俺は完全に手を引こう。<笑>で、次は。All right. No worries. All right. So, teaching them how to fish. <laughs> Doing all that fishing is so is so funny.、Um, I actually really, yeah, really like their, their relationship and like the fact that they meet as enemies、uh, on the battlefield and form this、uh, bond over time is、uh, is really incredible and it's it's written it's written very well as well、um, i really like that it's not just、uh, snake and miller just having a conversation and talking to each other if remember this it's like actually like fully acted out and all sound effects and everything which is like is so much more engaging it's just like you can like picture it in your head so much more than just like a conversation recounting the event Uh, two more chapters to go, so we're getting to chapter four now. Don't mess with the boss. Vic boss! Vic boss! Don't mess with the boss. Vic boss! 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 <laughs> Snake's already half blindfolded in real life anyway, so he's fine. <laughs> Smoking a cigar as well. It's a lot of air flight. Sugi wa hayagui da. Hayagui? Nanyo. あれだ。テイスティ。さっき取った魚、アロワナを。そう。しかも煮たり焼いたりはなしだ。生でか。そうだ。生切らいか。好んで食べはしないが。兵士たるもの。食える時に食えるものを食えるだけ食う。そんな
Tasty! Dude, he opened up his survival viewer for the first time in eight years, he said. He's like, survival viewer! Fucking, like... <laughs> <coughs> so, nine, yeah, because this is 1972 when they when they first met. God, that's so funny. I actually, I actually love that he actually, like, names the thing. He's like, first time in eight years. Eats the whole entire fish. It'd be nice if the subtitle said tasty, but he went for delicious. It's it's fine, but I'm I'm still very happy. <laughs> the actual sound effects as well of the menu is so funny to me. Tasty! There it is. There it is. Yarakaito,お前。あ、季節中がよく噛めば死ぬ。うわ。うん。うん。うん。うん。うん。うん。うん。うん。うん。うん。うん。うん。うん。うん。うん。うん。うん。うん。うん。うん。うん。うん。う
交渉決裂か残念だ<笑>俺を撃つのか命を取る気はない無事に出たいだけだ、うん、来るうんシークシーベイビースライトがマッシュのことがいつの間に You mean this? お前らこいつを捕まえろいいぞおおいおい違うって俺じゃないスネーク離せミラ許可すみませんなんだと We respect the boss more than we do you, Miller ミエル、ミツバチお前が治療中に手紙を渡した相手だなぜそれをあの手紙をあいつは真っ先に俺に見せたんだあれもあんたの仲間か<笑>で、俺は宛先のメンバーを回ったするとこいつら<笑>こところへ来たいと言って<笑>裏切ったのかビッグバース自断をしたってことだあ,あ、はい、ボスアメイゼンそれにしてもお前、監視役が一人だけだと思ったのか諜報活動はまだまだだ忍者の家系じゃないかなだが兵士の選別眼は悪くないお前が選んだこいつらはみんないい兵隊だお前が政府軍の工作員だっていうブラフの件もすぐに理解したどうやって抱き込んだ正面向かい合って話をしただけださあこれでお前も観念しただろう<笑>そうかカリスマの違いってわけかさたてどわっどけおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおおお Alright, moving into moving into chapter five. That was a that was a great sequence. Chapter four was awesome. <laughs> so good. And the boss just being like, mate, you playing chess while I'm playing checkers, man. Get out of here. I love that. Alright, we'll get into chapter five now. Ah, I can't. おい。どうした。かかってこい。くそ。好きだよ。うん。うわ。お前の朝日も好きだらけだったから。くそ。嘘をつけ。俺を刺してみろ。正面からどうぞと突っ込め。ダメだ。先がぶれてるぞ。俺の仲間になるか。俺は今度こそ本当に切腹するか。解釈はしてやるぞ。どちらも嫌なら俺の腕の中で果てるか。さあ、どうする。わかった。わかったから。<笑><笑> あんたからは逃げられないまさにヘビに狙われたカエルってわけだ観念したがあんた強すぎるしかも俺の部下まであっさり手なずけちまったじゃあ降参するないや俺は負けてないなんだとまだ最後の決着はついてない俺は負けていないお前まだだが。あんたと一緒にやりたい。協力しよう。つまり。共同経営者ってやつだ。金儲けをする気はない。そうじゃない。俺たち日本人はエコノミックアニマルだなって言われてる。金の亡者だってな。
それに見合う対価はもらうだが俺の目的は金じゃないなんだ認められたい証明したいんだ俺には夢があるあんたにも夢がある俺のは夢なんかじゃない俺にはわかるあんたとならそれができるそう確信したんだだが運営は俺に任せればいいあんたが望む主義も思想も国境も超えた軍隊、うん、一緒に作ろう戦う者の理想郷をあんたが望む理想郷を国境もなき軍隊あ<笑>お前はうんコネも実践経験もない外国人がなぜ共感職の契約を取れたのか理由が分かった気がするそうか結局失敗した理由は<笑>相手があんたとはついてなかったんだ立てるか起こしてくれ<笑>よろしくなボスしないくらいい決着もいつかつけるいいだろうそうだあんた女は何人くらいだ<笑>んものにした女だお,お前は、うん、これくらいいやこれくらいだあんたは俺か俺はスネーク気づいたか囲まれた縄張りに入り込んじまったようだなくっ二人だシッキュッシッあやすいぞ、consecutive シッキュッシッシッピースウォーカー tactics baby consecutive シッキュッシッキュッシッキュッシッキュッシッキュッシッキュッシやはり無法地帯の山賊風情かほぼそうだあいつらが危ない戻るぞまずは包囲網の突破だこれは戦いだ避けられないこともあるが救える命は奪うな了解戦友の腕前を拝見といこうコンタクト十字ケーキデーデコンパクト、正面、サブガンクリオ、ムーブフ<音声><音声><音声> Roll credits on their first encounter That's it. And that's it. Check that out. Amazing. <laughs> so that's that. That was their first meeting. I actually love like the amount of expansion that that got. And I really love that we literally just watched the sauna tapes, which is talking about where like when we first met you guys, we were like, how many women have I been with? And like it's literally done in here as well. Um, it's like, how many women have you been with? Um, and I, I love that.、Uh, I love that continuation. It's so good. So. We have two things left,、um, which is me reacting to the Paz Diary tapes. I'm going to boot up my own game for that because、uh, it's automatically just there. So I'm going to boot up my own, piece war,、uh, sorry, my own Ground Zeroes and we'll listen to Paz Diary and then the secret briefing file. So let's get into that now. First diary entry, let's go. As of today, I will be living here at Mother Base. Now my real trial begins. The doorknob was paying my room, board, and tuition, but he has since been captured. I told the man that with no more money from the KGB, I could no longer afford school. He bought my story, and when I said I would be willing to work, he took pity on me and let me stay. For some reason, Miller really pled my case. <laughs> 
That was helpful. But the man is still a fool. His men are no better. They think their training makes them strong. But that kind of strength is nothing in the face of true power. And better yet, they wait on me hand and foot, believing I am just a schoolgirl. Looks like I won't be working too hard after all. Just today, while scouting out the living quarters, I saw a group of them in the corner of the deck making a fuss. Going over for a look, I saw they were feeding a kitten. A bunch of grown hard men, and they are the ones acting like schoolgirls. Look, isn't he cute? What is wrong with them? Disgusted, I just nodded and smiled. I must stay in character after all. I indulged their chit-chat for a few moments. Then one of them asked me to give the thing a name. They had just taken it from its mother. I named it Nuke. I improvised some nonsense about how our compassion for living things can help prevent wars. The men gave me a little fish. I held it out in my palm and the kitten happily ate it up. What a pathetic, feeble creature. It sickens me. When Paz is just evil for the sake of being evil, like, it's not like she's, like, some Cypher agent with the intention to, you know, make Snake be the military outfit for Cypher. It's that Paz is literally just like, I'm evil and cats are disgusting. And, oh, <laughs> everyone's just, everyone's just fucking weak. It's just like, it's, it's, so, it's so weird to, like, get her internal like monologues and like her actual thoughts of like what's going on her being like this innocent like i said innocent schoolgirl character and then she's like i'm actually really evil today chico invited me to go fishing with the soldiers i suppose finding one's own food does have its merit but i prefer not to be involved in such a degrading task and their prattling on about fishing being fun is nonsense I'm not here to find playmates. Nevertheless, distasteful as it was, I went along in order to maintain my cover. Chico thrust a fishing pole into my hands, and we went up onto the deck where several soldiers had gathered. They welcomed us warmly. With so few women aboard Mother Base, I'm treated like a princess. No one suspects I am neither a teenager nor a student. It was nice and sunny with a gentle breeze and waves. As I cast my line and waited for a bite, the soldiers began to ask me all sorts of questions. As always, I answered according to our predefined scenario, feigning a smile. As I sat there feeding them lies, the fish began to bite, and the soldiers began to focus on their prey. Chico had his bait stolen by a fish, and got so angry that he stood up and nearly fell into the sea. Everybody laughed. It almost made me want to join in too. At some point, I got a bite myself. The instant after I felt that first gentle tug, the fish yanked the line with astonishing strength, and I let out a cry of surprise. I thought it was going to be huge. It was my first time fishing, and I was a bit flustered, so the soldier beside me helped by supporting the pole from behind. Reel it in, they shouted. I nodded, turning the handle as fast as I could. I wondered what kind of fish live below the surface, and thought back to the deep sea dives I had to do as part of training. Those were difficult days, but I remember finding the multicolored fish gliding through the water incredibly soothing. After a hard fight, I pulled it up. To my surprise, it wasn't even half a vara, rather anticlimactic. But I wasn't doing it for fun, so I wasn't the least bit disappointed. Nuke was hovering nearby with an expectant look on his face, so I gave the fish to him. All in all, a thoroughly wasted day. There was a bit of there was a bit of humanity there. There was a bit of Paz, you know, feeling some genuine emotions and being excited and surprised, but then she was like, This day was a waste fucking everyone sucks <laughs> like right at the end she's just like it's funny because like retroactively i still don't think it makes the actions of the previous things that like with pars okay that she's like not actually a teenager so cool she's of age but like in the moment we're all like man 
snakes a 39 year old man getting into a box with a kid it's just it's really weird um but yeah but internally she's like haha i'm evil <laughs> Um, but yeah, it's um, genuinely interesting to, to listen to. We'll get into the third entry now. Preparations are coming along nicely. No one suspects me of being the one to let Zadarnov out of his cell. Uh. Today, Amanda and I taught Cecile how to make gallo pinto. It is a simple home-cooked dish consisting of black frijoles mixed with arroz. It is well known throughout Central America, not just in Costa Rica. So it is no surprise that a Nika like Amanda would be good at making it. But I was raised in the States from a very young age, and can hardly even remember my mother's gallo pinto. Having to make chit chat with that clueless bird lover, <laughs> this so-called revolutionary was excruciating. And, clueless or not, I will need to be especially careful around Cecile, the one who actually recorded that tape. Thankfully, Miller and his men seem to believe I mistook the tape I found for one my friend made. In any case, one can never be too careful. Mm. Anyway, the three of us minced garlic and herbs, then cooked them in a pot with frijoles we'd soaked overnight. While waiting for them to cook, we sautéed onions and arroz in a frying pan. Cecile worked the frying pan according to Amanda's directions, but seemed a bit glum. She does have a knack for cooking, though. She is... French, after all. We added water to the pan and watched the arroz begin to steam. While we waited, Amanda shared memories of her mother with us. They had been separated because of Simosa, but the taste of her mother's cooking was still fresh in her mind. When the frijoles were ready, we drained the water, stir frying them with the rest of the vegetables. Quite a complicated process for home cooking. Nonetheless, it kept them occupied. The longer we sat and talked, the greater the chance of my arousing their suspicions. With women, it is not enough to just bat your eyelashes and giggle. It takes a lot of effort to divert attention. When the arroz was done cooking, we folded it into the frijoles and added salsa, stirring the mixture as it simmered. At this point, for some reason, the conversation turned to romance. Why does it have to be that way whenever women get together and chat? Cecile fancies herself to be well-versed in such matters, and gave Amanda all sorts of advice. It was harmless enough, until, to my irritation, she began pestering me whether there was anybody I liked. Not right now, I said, trying to dodge the question. But she pressed on. It's Snake, isn't it? I gritted my teeth and played it coy. Maybe. Cecile nodded and giggled. He is pretty sexy, isn't he? What a ditz! <laughs> if I can manage to just survive, the thought of romance has never once crossed my mind. I have no interest in that kind of man. Soon enough, a rich aroma began to fill the room. The gallo pinto was ready. New came over and rubbed up against our legs, looking for a handout. Unfortunately, it was not the kind of food a cat would like. We let a few of the soldiers have a bite, and then headed off to the mess hall. The home-cooked flavor we'd achieved was a big hit with the men of MSF. Not that we are trying to impress them or anything. Even I could manage a dish like that. Snake enjoyed it too. Let me make this absolutely clear. I have no interest in that man. <laughs> Interesting. Um, so even though I said I thought that it wouldn't be Paz who would be the one breaking Sorono out because I think they've got like different agendas no what did I say I'm getting confused with Paz's betrayal and it's affecting my previous memories um so I was like who could be the one breaking Zdornov out because they were like oh it's gotta be it's gotta be someone on the inside and I was like eh, I don't know I don't think it would. I don't think it would be Paz, but it it was Paz. Surprise! Um, Paz's fourth diary entry. Let's get into it. Football, or soccer as it is known in the states, is extremely popular here. It has not caught on yet in the U.S., 
but it has legions of rabid fans all across Latin America. These fans can get so rowdy that it is commonly believed El Salvador and Honduras went to war in 1969 over scuffles in a soccer match. In reality, tensions between the two countries were already high. The match was merely one of the sparks that set them off. But these people are so passionate about this sport that the story seems plausible. Predictably, many of the soldiers here are fans. They have apparently divided themselves into Costa Rican and Nicaraguan teams and started playing each other. To play, you need a ball and two goals. The R&D team built and set up simple goals on the deck. I had absolutely no interest, but Chico insisted that I come and watch. It was not a proper match by any means. The pitch was not even regulation size, but the players and spectators alike got pretty excited. They banged empty cans and shouted cheers through the handmade megaphones. It almost felt like carnival. Huey, the referee, <laughs> blew a whistle to start the match. The soldiers' training has left them in excellent physical shape, but they lack the honed skills of professionals and their play was quite rough. Midway through, one of the men collided with another. They started shouting at one another, but Huey stepped in. I thought we had forsaken our countries, become one with the earth, he said, quoting Snake. We are not competing for national pride here, and we are not fighting for the good of any one country. This is not a war. Soccer is a peaceful sport, am I right? The soldiers nodded. They know the pain of war, and they share Snake's vision. Perhaps that is why all this resonates with them. Team Costa Rica was down a man, and somehow I was picked to fill in. Costa Rica had the advantage up until that point. I suppose Huey wanted to keep it balanced. The soldiers agreed with Huey's call. Maybe the Costa Rican players felt an even matchup would be more fun, too. I could not be bothered to run at first. But chasing the ball out there in the hot sun, I was soon drenched in sweat. Before long, I found myself actively seeking out the ball, partially out of desperation. I picked up a loose ball deep on the opponent's side of the field. Even though he's Nicaraguan, Chico cheered me on, yelling, Go for it! Shoot! I launched the ball as hard as I could, only to have it blocked by the keeper. Disappointment only increased my determination. In the end, I didn't score a single goal, and Costa Rica gave up its lead. It was really close, though. We congratulated each other on a good match and sprawled out in the shade on the deck, exhausted. The ocean breeze felt so nice on my sun-soaked body. Nuke came over. It is one of his favorite spots, and stretched out next to me. And together, we watched fluffy white clouds drift lazily across the clear blue sky. In four diary entries, we've seen Paz going from like "I'm evil and hate everything" to slowly, to slowly warming up to things. And that's just in the fourth diary entry because she keeps mentioning Nuke, who she was like was like disgusting creature, and then she's just like hanging out, and like he cuddled up next to me and all of that stuff. So it's like it's it's uh, we're seeing Paz like warming up here, but like it makes me wonder if there was like some turmoil in her decision if she came to like the people here but then still followed through with her mission for, for Cypher. It was lovely out today, so I decided to sun myself in a lounge chair up on the deck when strange love came up to me. Despite the heat, she was in her usual long sleeves and pants. I waved at her. She looked away and mumbled, H Hello there! Fancy meeting you here. I asked if she needed anything, feeling her eyes creeping up and down my body like she was savoring it. Finally, she swallowed and said, You have such beautiful skin. Bewildered, I shook my head and said, No, not at all. I had heard rumors that she was a lesbian, but she couldn't be after me. Would she? She continued to stare and said, No, it is beautiful, but you must not let yourself get so tanned. 
and then she took my hand in hers. What is wrong with a little son, I asked, trying to cut the conversation short. But she shook her head violently. No, you mustn't. A young lady should take better care of her skin. She was acting strangely now, as if aroused. She lectured me on the perils of tanning, how it ages skin, causing wrinkles and spots, and in the worst cases, even skin cancer. I knew already that tanning could cause spots, but I thought only pale-skinned Anglo-Saxons had to deal with that. Having a scientist tell me it causes aging, though, that spooked me a little. If I am to keep playing the teenager, I will have to start paying more attention to my skin. Sensing my anxiety, she took a small tube from her pocket. She said it was the sunscreen she always used. She told me to keep it. I didn't know what to say. I was more than happy to take it, but exactly what were her intentions? Was she merely being nice? Or is she really into me? Either way, there was no reason to refuse, I suppose. I have undergone training. An out-of-shape woman does not pose any real threat to me. Having power means not being afraid. It is the same on a global scale. A country with nukes can dictate terms to a country without them. I thanked her and took the tube. Then she offered to put some on for me. She squirted some lotion onto her fingers and began rolling it into my chest. It happened so suddenly, and I was so taken aback that I did not even think to protest. She caressed my stomach with her long, white fingers, then slid them upwards between my bikini-clad breasts. What? Wait! I sputtered as her moist eyes met mine. She was beautiful. Somehow, I found myself captivated by this woman more than ten years my elder. Hold still, she whispered in my ear. I nodded silently, unable to refuse. My body went limp, motionless, as if in a trance. Gently, carefully, she rubbed the lotion all over my entire body. I shouldn't have enjoyed it. And yet, I could not help myself. For a moment, I was spellbound. That woman is dangerous. <laughs> I had better watch myself. All right, strange love. I thought you were in love with the boss and the boss only. Except you weirdly weirdly insinuated something with Huey at the end of Peace Walker as well so I don't even know what to assume it's like there was rumors that she's a lesbian and it seems that she's communicated very well that she's into men and women and not so much into men I mean it's possible that she's bi but at the same time it seems that she's heavily favoring one team over the other and um, that's why I thought that Huey interaction was strange sixth diary entry Protecting one's health is an important part of any agent's job. But despite my best efforts, I have caught a cold. Now that I think about it, Mother Base's numbers are on the rise, with soldiers coming from all different places and backgrounds. It is no wonder, then, that sooner or later, someone would bring in a virus. That said, what I have got is just a common cold. The medical team said I'd need a few days rest, so I've been restricted to my room and put on bed rest. I thought I'd gotten used to not having anyone around to relate to, but at times like these, being alone is just miserable. All I could do is lay there and stroke Nuke's back, trying to take my mind off how bad I felt. Nuke just sat there, not making a sound. But I did have visitors, Amanda and Chico, Huey, Cecile, Miller, and a few of the soldiers I've become relatively close to. Amanda made me a soup with herbs she said were good for a cold. Miller told me to take it easy. I will sing you a lullaby, he said, then broke out a guitar and sang some incomprehensible song in Japanese. I did not need to understand the lyrics to know he is an awful singer. Then he said, you know what is good for a cold? Suppositories. Here, I'll show you. He began to take off his pants, so I threw my tissue box at him to make him go away. 
Then, Strangelove showed up, saying she had some miracle Indian cure. It has got eucalyptus extract, she said. It works best if you rub it into your chest. And then, she tried to take off my nightshirt. I whacked her with my pillow, and I got rid of her. Chico brought me a little flower in a cup. It had been growing Chico. in a little purse that probably found its way on board stuck to something else. I found this on the deck. Here, you can have it. He tried to act nonchalant, but I am pretty sure he's got a crush on me. None of them understand. If they thought these little visits would cheer me up, they were wrong. Tonight, Snake himself came to my room. Like the rest, he believes I am just a schoolgirl and treats me as such. Why did you abandon your country, I asked him. Why create the MSF? Of course, I knew the answers already, but I wanted to hear it from him. As I had imagined, he was not exactly forthcoming. All he would say is that his country abandoned him because all he could do was fight. And that is why he needed the MSF, because that is all he is any good for. Then he said, fighting is the only thing I understand, but that does not mean I have got a grudge against those who believe in peace. I am not one of them, and I do not believe in peace. Conflict is in man's nature. We fight our enemies in order to survive. Maybe we are not so different after all, he and I. But that is exactly why I'm going to have to kill him. <laughs> or else he will have to kill me. When I stop and think about this wretched existence, being killed by a man like that suddenly does not seem like such a bad thing. I forgot to mention there, was like, either I'll kill him or he'll kiss me. It remembers of, like, when she mentioned earlier about, like, the, the diving, deep diving lesson stuff. And it's just like how her how her story ends in Peace Walker is that she drops down into the ocean. I'm like maybe she had some training there, so maybe she'll uh, maybe she'll come back. Maybe she'll come back. No way to know. We'll get into these last four diary entries and uh, see. I assume the tenth diary entry will end before the Metal Gear s sabotage. So let's see. Every month, Mother Base throws a party for all the soldiers whose <laughs> birthdays fall in that month. There is something strange about a military organization having parties. Really though, it is just an excuse to drink and make noise. It is not easy to get alcohol in a fortress in the middle of the ocean. Most days they are training from dawn till dusk. All of the wine that Miller ordered? Things like drinking. That is why Snake and Miller came up with the idea to give everyone a chance to let loose. Obviously, a bunch of boars like that are not going to bother with blowing out candles on a cake. Rather, they sit there in a cloud of cigarette smoke, drink beer, eat meat, tell tasteless jokes, and swap crude insults about one another's hometowns. But it hardly ever breaks out into something serious. They talk up a storm, but they're just having fun. It is funny. You have got members of FSLN rubbing shoulders with the UCLA's. People who once would have considered the other mortal enemies. I wonder if that is what makes Big Boss so popular. In leaving their countries behind, they leave their hatred for other countries too. Miller seemed a little protective of me. Hope they're not being too crude, he said. But soon enough, he too was drunk. He yelled, come here and take a look at the real Kazuhira Miller. Then dropped his pen and mooned everybody. The other soldiers burst out laughing. I have never seen such a crude, ridiculous party before. And yet, all these people laughing and acting the fool. Is this what they call peace? For some reason, I began to think about all that has happened since I came here. Fishing with Chico, cooking with Amanda and Cecile, playing soccer, having visitors when I caught a cold. When I stop and think about it, my time here has been the most peaceful of my life. But that is about to end. I cannot imagine you will be willing to negotiate. It seems I am to fight the legendary Big Boss. 
I do not know if I'll be able to beat him. But if I have to choose between death and defying Cypher, I will gladly choose death. The thought of dying does not scare me. But if I disobey my orders, the fear and despair awaiting me will be far worse than anything I can imagine. It was Cypher who took me in as an orphan, mm. gave me food and a place to live. His orders may have been unreasonable, but I will never repay my debt entirely. It seems I have no choice. I must fight this man. I must fight Snake. Everything begins and ends with zero. Do you know Miller, Snake's right hand man? Apparently has got at least one serious weakness. Women. He is an insatiable womanizer. He does not bother me. Most likely because he considers teenagers off limits. Apparently Snake doesn't. But he has hit on every single one of the few female soldiers here at Mother Base. They ought to be telling him where to stick it. But end up falling for it so easily. I think some of it stems from the fact that he is actually not that bad looking. Anyway, today... That nasty habit got him in trouble. He and Snake got into one of their rare fights, and I was there to see it. They burst out of the showers. Oh my god! Naked, trading punches. I am no child. The sight of a naked man does not make me blush, but this was something else. Maybe this will teach you, Snake yelled as he slammed his fists into Miller's chest. I heard later that apparently he had been two timing someone. And that same someone had gone to Snake with her troubles. As I see it, it is her own fault for letting herself be deceived like that. If she is too dumb to see through Miller's lies, then she got what she deserved. But this was not the first time it had happened, or the second. And Snake read Miller the riot act. Miller argued back, and what began as a shouting match turned into a fist fight. You son of a bitch, Miller yelled as he swung. Not bad, said Snake, smiling. But not good enough. And then he was back on the offensive. They had already been at it pretty hard in the showers, and their bodies were covered with bruises. Both of these men had been trained for war, their bodies deadly weapons. They were each bleeding from a dozen places. All this from a fist fight. Even so, it was far less gruesome than if they had given it their all. It was obvious that one of them would be dead were they fighting for real. Miller took another swing, yelling, Try this then! Snake parried, then responded in kind. But I could tell he was not aiming for anything vital. You are one tough bastard, boss, Miller muttered. A smile crept across his face as he caught his breath. And then they went right on fighting. Blood and sweat flew off their glistening bodies. He was combat without hatred or hostile intent. I had never seen violence like this before. And yet, it was more than just a friendly tussle. They were utilizing every technique they knew. It was not a sporting match. They were not playing by the rules. How could they keep this up? At last, the two men tired themselves out, and the bizarre scene came to an end. They looked at each other's battered bodies, and then burst out laughing, embracing and congratulating each other on a good fight. It all seemed so idiotic. I still cannot fathom such behavior, but somehow, I got the sense that for all his womanizing, Miller really only trusted one person, and that was Snake. There was no way I could ever come between the two of them, and at that thought, I began to feel as if I had lost. Mm. Uh, but then we have the context that we know, that Miller knew about her this whole time, and, uh... Professor Galvez, aka Zadornov. So very interesting stuff that Miller knew from. Miller was like ahead of everyone in the game. All of Mother Base is preparing for a festival. Since Snake and his soldiers spend so much time fighting, they are setting aside one day a year for peace and relaxation. I do not know all the details, but apparently that is what Snake and Miller decided. These soldiers love the idea, of course. There is so little fun to be had here that everybody looks forward to events like these. That is all well and good, but somehow I got roped into getting on stage. 
Come on, we even both have peace in our name, said Miller. And Zadarnath, that old Ruski's name, has something to do with peace too, right? <laughs> hey, as long as we are having a day of peace, we ought to get an act together. The Three Peace Band. I thought he was joking. He then proceeded to share his idea without bothering to check with me. And now, I am slated to sing. Apparently, he had heard me on the deck one day, and since then, he's wanted to form a band. Everybody's looking forward to it, so there is no way for me to back out now. I have never done anything like this, but it does feel kind of nice to know that people are looking forward to it. I mean, it cannot be any worse than Mueller's singing. But modifications to Zeke are already finalized, and mm. I must complete my mission. Betray Sai for now, and I will face a fate far worse than death. Still, there is no need to put things in motion just yet. What difference would it make to just wait a little while longer? A whole day of peace. The mission can wait until after that. Can it not? I know I am only delaying the inevitable. When the day comes, one of us will have to die. Snake or me. But still, if I could just come up with some way to stall Cypher, at least until our day of peace. Uh, when did I start having thoughts like this? Hmm. Knows what she has to do and she knows that she's going to do it, but there's a part of her that wants to delay it at least because she's warming, she's been warming up to everybody, which is, uh, which is very interesting stuff. Good character development from these, from just like these diary entries alone. My cover is blown. They know nothing of Cypher or my true objective, but they know I am a spy. There is no more time left. I must act now. I must complete my mission. How did it come to this? All I wanted was three more days. Just three. Miller's already finished writing the song. It is called Love Deterrent. I really like that we can pause so I can talk about it, but I was just going to mention as well that, um, yeah, they get Paz to sing. Paz sings that song in the final boss fight against Zeke, so I just like, I like that there's still like that sort of thing in in game that she sings her own song for her own boss theme and also while i'm on the topic of this being able to pl uh pause f files ah. being able to see how much time is left also Mwah. good stuff it is about a girl who cannot express her true feelings i've been practicing i am no pro but i was pretty sure i would do a decent job and now this. Cypher found out that Zeke was complete. He must have someone inside Mother Base besides me. Ooh. Spinning his tightly wound web of control, leaving no room for individual will. Interesting. When they found out Zeke was complete, I was ordered to execute the operation immediately. If I was going to enjoy just one day of peace, I had to ensure the plan could not move forward. I tried to sabotage Zeke. Oh. By damaging the drive system, they would have no choice but to delay their plans. I waited until midnight. That's why she was sabotaging. There would be trouble if it looked like sabotage. I selected one of the drive system's low bearing parts and carefully worked to warp its shape. The legs drive system requires a high degree of precision to operate. Even the smallest deviation would have done it. Then, Chico walked in. <laughs> Maybe it was one of those nights where he could not sleep. In any case, he saw me, panicked, and took off running. It would have been easy to kill him, but I could not. I know he likes me. It is not as if I would ever have an interest in a child like him, but I could not pull the trigger. Not at him, not in the back. Will he tell them? Or is there a chance he will keep it a secret? Protect me. No. He knows now. Knows I am not who he thought I was. He ran without even questioning what I was doing. There is no chance he does not know. And soon, all I have built here will end. 
And if Cypher has another agent among them, if he finds out I tried to sabotage Zeke, this place will no longer be my heaven. Then it is settled. I make my move now. Chico walked in before my sabotage was complete, so Zeke should still be operational. It might not run at full speed or power, but I do not have time to fix that. Without Zeke, I do not have a chance in hell of winning. I must act fast before Chico sounds the alarm. I knew it would come to this. <laughs> I just did not think it would be so soon. <laughs> it is time, Zeke. Metal Gear Zeke, activate. So what's really interesting there is she actually tried to sabotage it to delay it. it wasn't just like randomly sabotaging it and then also jumped in it because that wouldn't make any sense. So that's cool. That's Paz's diary. Good character development in 10 entries um, to see her warming up to everybody but still f forced to complete her mission under under Cypher. Um, but there you go. So that's that. That's that done. Um, nothing else so far um, to work our way through, but there is one final thing that we're going to get to now, and that is the secret briefing file. The secret briefing file um, to to listen to. So let's get into that one now. Secret file: the phone call. me. Smoothly? Naturally? No. Big Boss doesn't know the truth. No, Langley hasn't decided what to do yet. Their hands are full with their own mess. True. Lubyanka is in the same boat. Yes. Other eyes continue to watch, but no sign of contact so far. Exactly. It's a non-state army to use however they want. They probably decided there's no sense in wiping them out just yet. Better to make use of them. Indeed, they have. There's a site near Angola. And we fully validated the AI as well. Agreed. In the end, a machine is just that. A machine. Sigan was right. It seems it's time for a change in approach. Machines are best suited to specialize in high-level data processing. Yes, of course. Speaking of which, any news on the Suns? Two. Already. Really. But they're strictly an insurance policy, yes? Hmm. So that's the idea. I wonder how Big Boss will respond. Yes, but I'm only interested in the business angle. Like I said before, I'm neither an enemy nor an ally. I'm merely a business partner. Don't forget it. Yes, I'll be in touch. My dear Zero. Dude. 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 What the fuck? Oh man. Okay. So that's the that's the final that's a final final um That's a final briefing file. Like w once you've completed absolutely everything. And that's the type of phone call thing that you would normally get like at the end of the credits where you're it's normally ocelot. Miller is a business partner, not an enemy or an ally, but a business partner to both Big Boss and also to Zero. He's fucking playing both sides, but Miller's with us, and he's playing fucking both sides, and he gets the up... He mentions in the fucking name drop Sigint and the use for machines and what machines should be used for, which I guess is one line to kind of go, and this is why AIs don't start infiltrating the Metal Gears or whatever. Um, and then... 
checking in on the sons of Big Boss. Like two already. Liquid and solid. Um holy fuck, that's completely missable because you have to do you have to like hundred percent do absolutely everything. Like you could just not even listen to that tape. And then what the hell's gonna happen in Ground Zeroes and Phantom Pain now? It's like, are we ex are we expecting a double cross? Everyone's a fucking triple agent. <laughs> Everyone. Um poor Big Boss, he's about to get fucking betrayed uh for the upteenth time. My god, like <clears throat> that's quite a revelation. There's just there's been so much information that I've had to absorb today to bridge my gap between Peace Walker and Ground Zeroes, and that was the last straw. Does that mean that when Paz was like, maybe he's got uh, Zero has someone else here uh, checking on everything? He was referring to Miller. Miller was like a, is one of Zero's second agents, but like a business partner. Wow. Well, I guess that that one phone call does make some slight connection to me of how Master Miller is uh, Solid Snake's master because he's aware of what's going on at the moment so it seems there'll be a connection there. That's that's wild. That's that's something to think about. But with that one, guys, we are, I've taken in all of the information left over, tied up those loose ends. I really find it hilarious how, like, the sauna sequence, like, that we listened to, like, actually tied into other things, like the, the first encounter audio drama and Parser's Diary references it as well. Like, that was, this was, like, a really good, like, episode of just, in, like, good information, good world-building stuff. So I uh, hope you guys enjoyed it. This is uh, immensely uh a long episode of uh, all of that lore and information to prepare ourselves for ground zeros so thank you so much for watching um if you wanted to see me react to these these things and uh stay excited because ground zeros will be on approach um and it'll be it'll be a hell of a lot of fun to finally get back into a console metal gear game and uh see what see what that one's like so thank you so much for watching and i'll see you next time